Hello, saints, peace, grace, and love of Christ Jesus be with all of you. I hope everyone's having a blessed day today. In this study on Acts chapter 23, we're moving along wonderfully towards the end of the book of Acts, a very extremely important book in God's Word. We're going to see Paul speak before the Sanhedrin. And who's the, the Sanhedrin? Well, they're the Jewish Mosaic uh, authority, if you will. The law-minded Jews are going to conspire to kill Paul for what they believe is an apostasy on Paul's behalf. It is trying to create this apostasy against the laws of Moses. And we're also going to see a Roman authority named Lysias, who's going to arrange to transport Paul from Jerusalem to Caesarea to stand before another Roman authority who's named Felix. Now, in our last study on, the back, on the chapter 22, first we saw Paul giving his testimony. And chapter 22 gives us part of Paul's overall lifelong testimony, if you will, for the past 23 years. But specifically, Paul encounter, his encounter with Jesus Christ on the way to Damascus is what Paul wants everyone to understand. And next, we took a look at verse 16, a somewhat difficult verse for some saints starting out in right division. And I was one of those. I had questions about verse 16, and I had to study it out. And why is there questions? Because it says that Paul got water baptized amongst some, some, fewer, some more things. In Acts 22, let's read that, verse 15 and 16. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men. And this is Ananias speaking to Paul in Damascus. For thou, Paul, shall be his witness, Jesus' witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. And now, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So the question was, why was Paul water baptized? What's this washing away of sins it makes it sound what we're reading makes makes it sound like we need water baptism to wash our sins away well first of all our sins are washed away by the blood of Christ that's the only thing that's gonna wash your sins away there is only one means of washing sins away and that is the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross and the fulfillment of his work on that cross, the death, burial, and especially, especially that power of resurrection. Okay? Through our study, we saw how Paul's water baptism was for the benefit of Ananias, who is a kingdom saint. And not necessarily for Paul's benefit, who is, we know, already sealed by the Holy Spirit and added to the body of Christ. Now, Israel's promise is that they will be a kingdom of priests and kings let me re let me repeat that israel israel's promise not the body of christ israel's promise part of the covenant part of the all the prophecies is that they will be a kingdom of kings and priests okay no such promise is made for the body of christ and in order to be a king and priest, their laws, their, their mosaic system of laws, call for water baptism. All right? The phrase, calling on the name of the Lord, if you remember in our study in Romans 10, is a quote, is a quote from the book of Joel, chapter 2. Peter also quotes Joel, chapter 2, early on in Acts chapter 2 and verse 21. If you want to look at that, let's look at Joel 2 real quick because this is so very important to understand. Joel 2, starting at verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons, your daughters, whose sons and daughters Israel's sons and daughters shall prophesy your old men shall dream dreams your young men 
shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Verse 31. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Verse 31 gives us the time period that this is all going to take place in. Before the day of the Lord come. We're talking about Daniel's 70th week here. Okay. And it shall come to pass in verse 32 and it it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance where is this deliverance going to take place in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord hath said in the remnant Israel whom the Lord shall call okay so who's calling on the Lord here the remnant in Mount Zion in Jerusalem they are the ones that will, shall call on the name of the Lord in verse 32 whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered who was Joel just talking about those in Jerusalem and Mount Zion Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Delivered from what? Delivered from Jacob's trouble. The tribulation period. Daniel's 70th week. So Peter quotes Joel in Acts chapter 2. And also Paul quotes Joel in Romans 10. They're both speaking about Israel. Both speaking about the last day's prophecies. Now, I made a video concerning Romans 10, Acts 2, and Joel 2, which is a little more detailed concerning all of this that I've just been talking about, calling on the name of the Lord, and so on. The name of the video, the title of it, is Urgent, Romans 10, The ABC Salvation, okay? And it is on my channel, and you can go look at that if you want more details on Romans 10, Joel 2, Acts 2, Peter, Paul, Joel, the prophecies of the last days, calling on the name of the Lord, who is delivered, who is saved, what kind of salvation is it? There's more than one type of salvation all throughout the Bible. The word saved is mentioned hundreds of times throughout the King James Version Bible. Maybe less than that or a little more, I'm not sure, but it's mentioned a lot, okay? And actually, I think I mentioned the exact number, the amount of times the word saved is mentioned in the King James Version Bible in that study that I just mentioned. Now, Paul has been arrested, okay? The year is 57 to 58 AD. Paul's been arrested by the Romans, okay? Fulfilling a prophecy that was made by Agabus. The Roman authority gives Paul permission to speak to his kinsmen, the Jews, speaking in a Hebrew tongue, Aramaic. Now, Paul is before the Sanhedrin Council, okay, the authority over the Jews, and that leads us in verse 1 of our study on Acts chapter 23. And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, he's speaking to the Jews here, okay, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall, for sittest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? And they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest? Now, we know from the last chapter why the Jews are so angry with Paul. Okay, Paul told them that their God has left them because of their denying the Father. They killed the Son and they, they denied and blasphemed the Holy Spirit when they killed the prophet Stephen. 
God gives them three chances and they blew it. In verse 5, then said Paul, I was not, brethren, that he was the high priest. Paul didn't know he was a high priest, for it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. So Paul didn't know that this was the Sanhedrin's authority that was speaking to him. But verse 6, but when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee the son of a Pharisee, of the hope and resurrection of the dead. I am called in question. And when he had said, and we so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. And there arose a great cry, and the scribes, that were of the Pharisees, part arose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man. But if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. So Paul, very interestingly here, turns the attention from himself by creating an argument in the Sanhedrin. Now the Sadducees and the Pharisees are no longer focused on their anger towards Paul. But now they're arguing about whether the resurrection exists or angels or spirits itself. In verse 10, And when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, killed, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. Now why would Paul be of good cheer? He, the, the Jews all want to kill him. Well, for one, our Lord Jesus just tells Paul, he just told Paul that he wasn't about to die in Jerusalem. Okay, and that must have been a relief to him. But that he would live through this, and he would not be killed just yet and he would be used by the Lord as a witness to all men in the city of Rome now in verse 12 and when it was day certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul and they were more than 40 which had made this conspiracy and they came to the chief priests and elders and said we have bound ourselves under a great curse that we will eat nothing until we have slain Paul. Now, therefore, ye with the council signify to the chief captain that he bring him down unto you tomorrow, as though ye would inquire something more perfectly concerning him, and we, or ever he come near, are ready to kill him. And when Paul's sister's son his nephew heard of their lying in wait he went and entered into the castle and told Paul then Paul called one of the centurions unto him and said bring this young man unto the chief captain for he hath a certain thing to tell him so he took him and brought him to the chief captain and said Paul the prisoner called me unto him and prayed me to bring this young man unto thee who has something to say unto thee then the chief captain took him by the hand and went with him aside privately and asked him, What is it that thou hast to tell me? And he said, The young man said, Paul's nephew, The Jews have agreed to desire thee that thou wouldest bring down Paul tomorrow into the council as though they would inquire somewhat of him more perfectly. In other words, the nephew says, They're planning to... Sabotage, sabotage Paul and they want you to bring Paul down to the council tomorrow and while you bring Paul down to the council we're gonna jump on him and kill him okay verse 21 but do not thou yield unto them for there lie in wait for him of them more than 40 men which have bound themselves with an oath what they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him and now are they ready looking for a promise from thee so the chief captain then let the young man depart and charged him, 
See thou, tell no man that thou hast showed these things to me. And he called unto him two centurions, saying, Make ready two hundred soldiers to go to Caesarea, and horsemen threescore and ten, and spearmen two hundred, at the third hour of the night, and provide them beasts, that they may set Paul on, and bring him safe unto Felix the governor. If you remember all the way back in our study in Acts chapter 10, we were introduced to the centurion Cornelius, a Roman officer, and we discovered that a centurion is in charge or in command over 100 men. So two centurions is 200 soldiers. Plus, we have an additional three score and 10, which would be an additional 70 horsemen. Then we read, there's an additional 200 spearmen added as well. The chief captain provides over 470 soldiers to protect Paul because Paul is a Roman citizen by birthright. Now, why so many soldiers? Well, if you think about it, 470 soldiers really isn't that much considering there's thousands of Jews who are rallying against Paul at this point. Remember, remember what James said back in Acts 21. Let's read that, Acts 21, 20. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. That's where we get the word apostasia. Saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. So all these Jews are zealous about the law. They're zealous about the Mosaic system. Well, they're not so happy with Paul at this point. They all believe that Paul is causing an apostasy, a falling away, the apostasia, they all believe that Paul is wrong and he needs to die before any more Jews lose their faith in the Mosaic system. And we know the word apostasia means to fall away from the faith, specifically the Mosaic faith. So now we see why there's close to 500 soldiers, there's 470 soldiers protecting Paul. Now continuing on, Acts 23:25, and he wrote a letter after this manner, Claudius Lysaeus. So now we're told who this Roman authority is. He's writing the letter and their common writing practices back then, they would address themselves first. Okay, they would put their name first and then they would address the person they're writing to. So Claudius Lysias is the person writing unto the most excellent governor, Felix, sending greeting. This man was taken of the Jews and should have been killed of them then came I with an army and rescued him, having understood that he was a Roman. And I, when I would have known the cause wherefore they accused him, I brought him forth into their council, whom I perceived to be accused of questions of their law, but to have nothing laid to his charge worthy of death or of bonds. And when it was told me how that the Jews laid wait for the man, I sent straightway to thee. And gave commandment to his accusers also to say before thee what they had against him. Farewell. Then the soldiers, as it was commanded them, took Paul, brought him by night to Antipatris. On the morrow they left the horsemen to go with him and return to the castle. Who when they came to Caesarea and delivered the epistle to the governor, presented Paul also before him. And when the governor had read the letter from Lysias, he asked of what province he was. And when he understood that he was of Cilicia, a Roman territory, I will hear thee, said he, when thine accusers are also come. And he commanded him to be kept in Herod's judgment hall. Herod's judgment hall was a castle, a plush mansion. Paul was very comfortable he was protected, okay? Protected from all his enemies. So the kingdom saints, the Jews, didn't necessarily get along with Paul, his teaching, or even the body of Christ at this point. There's two groups of believers in the book of Acts. The kingdom saints, the kingdom program, and the body of Christ, okay? Understanding this helps us to understand why the kingdom, the kingdom gospel has to diminish and the gospel of grace has to increase. 
if you look at the uh, diagram in front of you, notice right after Stephen, over to the right, right underneath that, it says fall. This is the fall of Israel. This is when they killed Stephen. And it was their last chance, their third chance, to accept and usher in the earthly kingdom. They kill Stephen, blaspheming and rejecting the Holy Spirit. So their fall is created. Okay, And this fall is the book of Acts. It is a 30 plus year period. Okay, It is 30 plus years that the kingdom program declines and the gospel of grace increases and will last over 2,000 years. And when the rapture happens, that's going to end the dispensation of grace. And the kingdom dispensation will commence once again. So you can see how they're going to be worshiping during Daniel's 70th week. The kingdom program is going to be in full force once again. It's going to be much different than what we have today in the body of Christ. So when people ask me, is there going to be another chance to get saved after the rapture? They don't realize what system they're going to be dealing with during Daniel's 70th week. It's, it's going to be just like it was back in early Acts. And God is going to be concentrating on the lost sheep of the house of Israel once again, not the Gentiles. So now you know why God's word says, those who bless Israel will be blessed. Those who feed the Jewish prisoners and give them water will be blessed. Those who help the Jews get through Daniel's 70th week will be blessed. The Gentiles will have to go through Israel to get to God once again, just like it was in, in the four Gospels. Just like they did when Jesus walked the earth. God is going to create a kingdom of kings and priests on the earth, and they're all going to be Jews. Then, below them, you're going to have the proselytes. Then, under them, you're going to have the Gentiles. So, my answer to that question, the people who ask, can I still be saved if I miss the rapture, is no, you can't be saved like you can be saved today. By faith alone, through grace alone. Okay? It's important to understand that to be saved out of Daniel's 70th week is a physical salvation. Today, in our dispensation, we have a spiritual salvation. We're sealed by the Holy Spirit. In order for a Gentile to be saved out of Daniel's 70th week, they're going to have to endure until the end, just like the Jews. They're going to have to avoid the Antichrist. They'll have to somehow, by some miracle, by some chance, not be deceived when God allows the deception to take place. And that's a slim chance. The book of Revelation tells that all will receive the mark of the beast. So, for a Gentile to make it through to the end of Daniel's 70th week is a slim to none chance. But, some will make it. Some will be protected. Some will be blessed because they'll bless. They're going to be uh, blessing and helping the Jews, the remnant of Jews, the 144,000 and so on, make it through. Anyway, I digress just a bit, but it's very important to get saved now. There's no reason why the rapture cannot happen today, tonight, or tomorrow. We're in the time period for the rapture right now. And when you look at what's taking place in Israel right now, along with all the other things happening around the globe, the time is ripe for the rapture to take place. Okay? In conclusion, Paul has been arrested. The Romans are protecting him from the believing, zealous, in the law Jews. And the Romans are about to transport Paul to Rome. Jesus tells Paul not to worry, to be brave, have cheer, that he's going to witness to all men, give his testimony once again in Rome, one day soon, in the city of Rome, in the land of Gentiles. And again, we're right around the year 59 AD. Now, that concludes our study on Acts 23. Peace, grace, and love of Christ Jesus be with all of you. Lord willing, I will see you on the next study for Acts chapter 24. Ooh.